are. Oh, well, let's go then. Uh, so a couple of questions that have come up as you guys have been making your posters. Uh, one of them is, as we take a look at the periodic table, people were wondering how we can predict the charges that ions become. Uh, first of all, I guess, Mrs. May, let's talk about uh, how is it that something becomes an ion? What happens to it? Well, it has everything to do with electrons. So you guys are reading about in your book, if you lose electrons or gain electrons, not protons, you guys, because that might change the element totally. But if you gain an electron, which is negative, you become negatively charged. You lose an electron, you become positively charged. Cool. Ultimately, there's, there's one family on the periodic table that you got to pay extra special attention to, and it's this group right here on the far right side of the periodic table. We call those the noble gases. Uh, ultimately, all of those representative elements, or all of those, uh, what's the other name that we call the representative elements? The main group elements right. is the other thing they're called, uh, are trying to become like the noble gases. Mrs. May, what is it that's special about the noble gases? Well, the noble gases, as we'll learn later, really have filled energy levels of electrons, um, but they're not very reactive. Yeah. So Ultimately, you can boil it down to one word, stability. Uh, everybody's trying to achieve that stability that the noble gases ignore have. Ignore that, Ooh, people. Ignore that. Didn't happen. Uh, so if I take a look just at the electrons for a real simple view of this to start, and I can actually just take a look, for instance, at fluorine, at the total number of electrons that fluorine starts with, it has nine electrons. So I take a look at the noble gases that are nearby it, and I take a look and I see neon has 10 electrons. I see helium has two electrons. So theoretically, if atoms gain or lose electrons to become like the noble gases, theoretically fluorine could either lose seven electrons or it could gain one. I think it's way easier to gain one. So let's do that. Okay. So when I gain electrons, that fluorine atom is now going to have nine protons still, because we didn't change anything about the protons. And now it's going to have 10 electrons, the nine that it started with and the one that it gained. Because normally, in a neutral atom, they would have the same number of protons and electrons so that it had no charge. So now, in this case, it gets an extra electron. Which, if you do the math on this, overall, you put those together, fluorine now has a minus one charge. It's uh, perhaps a little counterintuitive that it gained electrons and took on a minus one charge. It's just one of those uh, things you have to accept about the, uh, the charge of an electron being negative. In math, you added a negative. So fluorine takes on a minus one charge, becomes an F minus one ion. And you can see the same thing in chlorine. I mean, take a look at chlorine. Chlorine would prefer to have actually, as it turns out, the same number of electrons as a noble gas. So it could gain one more electron and have the same number as argon, or lose a whole bunch to get 10. And so it's still easier to gain one. And same with bromine and iodine. And so this entire family, if they form an ion, likes to form a minus one charge. The halogens. Oh, good, which you should know How about. that for vocab? You gotta like it. Uh, as a matter of fact, if we take a look at most of these atoms over on the right side of the periodic table, they're gonna tend to want to gain electrons to become like the noble gases. Yeah, it takes less electrons to, to look like the noble gas forward. So to speak. Whereas, if I take a look at the other side of the periodic table, like say, let's take a look at these alkaline earth metals here, where beryllium is the top of the column. Uh, take a look at element number four, just to start off. Uh, beryllium theoretically could gain six electrons to become like neon, or lose, lose two. two. Yeah, because here's helium with two, and here's neon again with ten, so it could either gain six or lose two. It looks like it's going to go with the lower number here. Got it. So same idea of yeah, beryllium has four protons, and now it's only going to have two electrons if it loses those two to become like neon. You put that together, ooh, and it takes on a two plus charge. So similarly, we can take a look at the lithium family, lithium and sodium and all of that. Same thing. It's easier for them to just lose an electron to look like the noble gas over here on the other side than to gain, say, seven more. So this family is going to tend to form a plus one charge. You got it. So that's a quick way that you can predict the kinds of charges that atoms are going to take on when they become ions. Now, an interesting thing uh, to note is an atom doesn't become an ion on its own. Sodium, as an alkali metal here, doesn't become a plus one ion unless there's somewhere for that electron that it is losing to go. If only we could find an atom that was anxious to take an electron, Mrs. May. Oh, well, it's 
seems like there's lots of choices. Really, anybody over on this side of the chart likes to gain electrons, so we can certainly choose somebody over there. You got it. The easiest one, probably, and the one that most of you are familiar with, probably going to be chlorine. Uh, <laughs> makes the, the compound sodium chloride. Sodium ga uh, gives up that one electron. Chlorine takes it. They give each other a high five to be like, sweet, we both became noble gases. That's awesome. But in that process of high-fiving each other during the transfer of that electrons, sodium, now a positive ion, and chlorine, now a negative ion, as we know from years of high school dating, opposites attract. And so we end up making the compound sodium chloride when sodium, a plus one ion, and chlorine, a negative one ion, get near each other and become right. that. All right, so literally what we want to talk about is a little differences because sodium chloride is actually a specific kind of compound and there's more than one kind of compound that we need to take a look at. So let's kind of peek at sodium chloride is what we call an ionic compound because it is composed of ions. <laughs> and then we also have molecular compounds which are composed of Molecules. <laughs> now let's add one thing to our chart here because this is, these are not different ways to look at NACL, oh, yeah, but sorry. rather My different ways to organize <laughs> compounds. compounds yes. NACL is, as Mrs. May mentioned, only one of these two types. It is specifically an ionic compound made of the positive and negative ions yeah, that, that we talked about. Uh, one of the ways that we can prove that sodium chloride is an ionic compound is and by the way, an ionic compound, if we take a look at like a block of salt, it's actually made of this repeating pattern of ions, Na pluses and Cl minuses, over and over and over again in that crystal structure that if you guys have ever taken a look at a salt crystal, you know it's like this cool cubicle thing. Uh, and we can prove that salt is made of these uh, alternating ions by just taking salt and dissolving it in water and running a simple test on it. Okay, so if we take salt, so here's our, our little beaker of water, and we were to take this salt crystal and drop it in, what we see, if we were to say magic school bus ourselves inside of that <laughs> water, we would end up seeing awesome. actually it breaking apart into sodium ions and chloride ions, the actual water molecules coming in kind of pull it apart. You got it. So. We, can, we can't see that happening. However, what we can do is we can uh, put in a, what we call a conductivity tester. A conductivity tester, we'll actually probably get one out in class, won't we? Yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. So it's basically just a little two-wired probe that's hooked up so that you have a light bulb. That's the worst light bulb I've ever that's seen. really ugly. Uh, a two, like a light bulb. <laughs> Uh, hooked up so that if you can conduct electricity from one of these probes over to the other, it'll make the light bulb light up. And sure enough, if you submerge this conductivity tester, ooh, nice, uh, you submerge the conductivity tester uh, in a uh, sodium chloride solution or a salt solution, it does light up, showing that there must be ions that are making that compound up. Well, you know, there's really kind of a rule, in, because one thing I want you to, to understand is that this, when sodium chloride is dissolved, it conducts electricity. But if you took that same apparatus and stuck it in a container of salt, that's my light bulb. Nice. Uh, it's really ugly too. <laughs> um, if I put it in just some solid salt, wah, wah, yeah, it wouldn't light up. Yeah, it doesn't. So the key requirement is in order for a, a substance to conduct electricity, there needs to be moving charge particles or charge particles that have the ability to move from one of the probes to the other, one lead to another. Good. So to conduct electricity, I'm just writing down what Mr. Woods just said, you have to really, you have to have moving charged particles. So we have charged particles in both of them because they're made up of ions. But in a solid, they're stuck, so they're not able to move. In the liquid, they're f able to freely flow between one and another, so that's going to conduct electricity. You got it. So let's move to molecular compounds. And probably one of the more familiar molecular compounds that we have, or we want to start with this one, or water. C uh, C sorry, C12, yeah. H22, O11. Can I fix that? C12, 
This is sucrose, the stuff that we'll refer to quite a lot during the course of the year. Uh, and if we take a look at it, it's not made of attracted opposite charges. In fact, all of these elements are non-metals on the periodic table. And so they're not going to be positives and negatives that are going to attract. Compared to, like when we looked at that ionic compound, part of what makes these made of ions is sodium is a metal, and those metals like to be positive. The chlorine is a non-metal, and they like to be negative. So we notice that these ionic compounds tend to be made of a metal plus a non-metal. Whereas the molecular ones tend to generally be made of nothing but non-metals, if you take a look at them. So we take this same, we, we go through the same procedure, basically, that we went through in the la last case. We take a beaker of water, we take our sugar and put it down in here, we hook up our, <laughs> I'm going to get better at drawing this conductivity tester. Oh, that's so much worse. Until you see it, you guys, you're not going to know why yeah. he's drawing it like that. Yeah, really <laughs> we have to bring it in. <laughs> okay, note to self. But we submerged this conductivity tester into a, a beaker of dissolved sugar. I had to pick one that has such a long formula, right? C, 12, H, 22, O, 11. Uh, floating around, separated in water, and again, wah, wah, nothing happens. No lighting up, no indication that there is moving charged particles. There are none. But yet, it does actually have moving particles because sugar, you guys know, sugar dissolves in water. I mean, and, and it's moving around. So it, it can it obeys this part, but there are no charged particles. So it doesn't. And you could think about simply if you had a beaker of solid sugar, just as comparison, we did solid salt, and you put your conductivity tester in, but <laughs> mine looks like a balloon. That's right. Same thing, though. Nothing would happen with your conductivity tester because, again, there's no... In this case, there's no moving particles and no charged particles uh, in that solid stuff. So just a quick overview of ionic versus molecular compounds and a little discussion about ions themselves. All right, I think that's it. Good luck. Okay.